uh, in the back and then serve. But in terms of the land grab, yeah. are there any models for uh, over resistance yeah. and for successfully re, uh, rejecting yeah. the, the Israeli uh, take, taking of land? Sure. Well, for example, I mean, is there attempt to legitimize the uh, former owners through, through affidavits and testimony mm -hmm. and, and to make a repository of, of actual uh, land possession? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of studies, uh, sorry, a lot of research has gone into this, especially from uh, what, what we, what, what's uh, yeah, the Institute for Palestine Studies, when it was founded in Beirut, carried out extensive documentation. It was founded by Palestinian refugees in Beirut. And it carried out extensive documentation, you know, and so there's, there's, you can tie a lot of the refugees directly to where they were from, you know. Now, a lot of those villages, of course, have been demolished in their entirety, you know, so the actual physical home might not be there, but they can be tied to a very specific place regardless. Um, so a lot of that research has been done. You have uh, groups inside Israel, like Zohol, which means memory, and which is primarily composed of Palestinians, but also uh, radical Israelis as well. And Zohol actually, you know, they, they conduct tours, for example, you know, to, and they plant signs about what's the history here. What is that little terrace that you see? It looks like a terrace. Turns out it's part of an old, uh, kind of old city wall that was demolished around 1948. And so they, they try to put, put the older history into a living space. You know, what does it mean today? So there's activism and there's research. And internationally, there's all kinds of examples about redress, you know. Um, uh, you can ask, where did Rhodesia go, you know, for a great example, where you had lots of land redistribution from the settlers back to the indigenous population. Elements of that have happened in South Africa. Elements happened in Algeria very differently, where the settlers were expelled entirely. In Rhodesia, they were not. South Africa, they're not. What's going on in New Zealand is not the expulsion of the settler society, but there's a lot of redress going on. It's very imperfect in New Zealand, but compared to most settler societies, it's got a shockingly self-conscious discussion about settler colonialism. And so if we look internationally, it's one of the reasons I find these comparisons really useful, is not only do I learn more about Palestine or the United States by looking at the French in Algeria, you know, or South Africa or New Zealand or wherever, it also provides all kinds of different opportunities for resistance. What's things that have or haven't worked in other places? You know, if we're fighting for uh, social justice or decolonization or indigenous title or for respect to treaty rights, you know, what are other ways that it's happened? And, uh, and around the world, there's a wealth of examples if we can humble ourselves enough to learn, you know, from other folks. Here, then here, then here. You've talked about separation. Mm. You've invoked South Africa. Mm. What are your thoughts on applying the term apartheid to Israel and Palestine? I, I, think, I think the term apartheid is useful in certain contexts. It doesn't describe the entirety, you know. Um, there's, there's a good article... Uh, that was kind of revelatory for me at the time. It's actually not like particularly radical. It's just a very good legal analysis that was done by a fellow named uh, John Dugard, who was at the time the international uh, rapporteur, you know, for, for human rights. And so he published this article just a few years ago now, and and he says that what's being done in uh, what, what Israel is doing shares a few different is resembles three different regimes that the international community rejects entirely, at least in theory. Colonialism, uh, military religion, military occupation, and apartheid. It says it has elements of all three of these things. And so while apartheid might not be perfect in all instances, it's a very fair generalization, and I think it's entirely justified to use, both for Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Um, but apartheid doesn't really deal well with, for example, the central part of the, both the Palestinian people and of the uh, uh, political demands, which is the right of return, the refugees. The refugees aren't held under an apartheid system. They're outside the system altogether, you know. And so, so while I support the use of the term apartheid, uh, it doesn't it doesn't describe the entirety of the situation. And I find that settler colonialism is a framework that you can engage. That you can include apartheid, military occupation, and uh, uh, colonialism. It, it, it's an it's an umbrella. And so the apartheid policies, you know, you can describe and should be described. And I think the comparison should be made, right? So, in, in discourse here in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, where we're trying to convey the nature of the occupation, the exploitation, and so forth, yeah. 
do you see apartheid as a useful term to use? I, I find so. I find so. I mean, I, I find the way I connect, the way I connect best with new audiences, generally speaking, is to describe a process, and then sometimes I name it at the end. You know, uh, the pe people can make you know uh, the immediate connections when we say the word apartheid are the right ones. You know, they're the exact right ones. And so sometimes people won't listen if you start with that. But put it in the third sentence. You know, like give a little bit of context and then say, this is why, something like that. Um, and so I find it very useful because people have already learned to be horrified by the word. And when we can back up the term, you know, because there's very few pro apartheid people in the United States, like some crusty old Afrikaners, you know, who may have left or something like that. Or Dick Cheney, you know. Uh, if you don't recall, Dick Cheney wrote a letter opposing the release of Nelson Mandela. He wrote to the clerk, actually. Um, so this is, what, a decade before he was vice president? Didn't come up somehow? Um, and, so the, um, and so there are still, obviously, apartheid apologists and what have you, but it's such a tiny percentage of the population that uh, I think people have the proper response to it. But we also have to be careful that what we say is we don't just want to end to apartheid and integration because we can't leave out the refugees. It's central to the narrative. And when we talk about this logic of elimination, it's the majority of the Palestinian people. You know? And so that, that's the only caution I would say, is make sure we use it in a way that, we, that, we, that the refugee narrative, which is central to Palestinian political demands, um, is part of it. And I think one of the, easy, the safest ways to do that is to, um, you could call it, respect Palestinian political subjectivity, you know? So, I mean, empower Palestinian voices about Palestine. And this is one of the things that I was a little nervous about at first. I said, you know, my voice, and, you know, I'm Jewish, and that's unacceptable, and no matter what ridiculous thing I might say, because I can be part of legitimate discourse, right? I'm one of the nice white people. And in, but, in, um, but respecting Palestinian subjectivity is difficult. Because when we're supporting Palestinian voices in the United States, we're contending not only with Israeli racism and with colonialism there, we're, we're uh, contending with Islamophobia in the United States. We're contending with anti-Arab racism in the United States. And so at first that seems like an extra burden, you know, like to empower Palestinian voices specifically. But if we think about it, well, that's actually a strike not only for liberation in Palestine, but also against Islamophobia here, against systemic white supremacy here. And so it offers a lot of you know, potential uh, uh, liberation uh, um, uh, in that way. So, and then here, then here. So. I'm interested to know yes. what the thinking is of the average Israeli citizen, mm -hmm. particularly in terms of peace now, which sure. we don't hear too much about. Yeah. But beyond that, I cannot understand how it is that the government of Israel yes. acts as a bully yes. against other people. Yes. It's a violation of our history and our culture For sure. to see that happen yes. and to occupy other people. Yes. I can understand that. Right. Well, I think th this is one of the things as well. Like, If we remember, a lot of the people who made settlements in the United States uh, were Quakers. And we, assert, we associate Quakers with slave abolition, you know, with, with, with kind of a progressive history. And so, but the fact that they were part of indigenous removal and early on part of African slavery, and then even as the Quakers were becoming abolitionists, the Quakers were supporting, they, they, they founded what was called the American Colonization Society. And what the American Colonization Society wanted to do was as part of ab uh, the abolition of slavery to create another settler state, which is the legacy of which what we call Liberia. And so it was to free the slaves and ship them to Africa, you know, except they wouldn't be Africans anymore, right? They'd be black, U.S. black uh, citizens. And so the relationship that they found in Liberia was completely different, you know. Um, and, and they weren't dead, they weren't true, they weren't, you know. And so, but, but this is part of the Quaker history, you know. And it doesn't negate anything good that any Quaker community has done, or their, or their religious persecution in Europe and such, right? Uh, which, uh, again, they never, you know, uh, uh, were targeted in a, the same systemic way that, that we were, for example. Um, but in... But that history, these histories aren't mutually exclusive, and uh, which is, I think, one of the, the big lessons there. But another thing, too, and that there's a really cautious uh, thing that sometimes, uh, and I, in the past I've said this myself, you know, that, you know, I can't believe, you know, we've got this legacy, expulsion and all of this stuff. We've got this legacy. Leaving aside the humanism, right, for a second. We've got this legacy. How can we do this again, you know? But what that does is it says that you should learn from being brutalized. You know, that says that the way to become a better person is to be horribly oppressed. 
Thus, the way, I mean, if you want to take that to its logical extreme, the way to produce a completely ethical society is to oppress everyone horribly. And obviously that's not the right thing. You know, that's obviously not the right thing. And so this process itself, in the, in the process of colonization, you know, these conditions created Palestinian removal. Um, the same way that it happened with the British. I mean, part of, you know, the British here, you know, or uh, uh, Irish convicts in Australia. It's not like the Irish convicts were very free, you know. And they had a hard time over the British. But in Australia, they become colonists themselves. And so I, I think I think focusing on these processes is a way, one, to, to get out of the ethnocentric narrative, you know, um, but also to, to kind of uh, empower an understanding for how these things happen. It helps us learn a little bit more about the human condition, as well as our own history. You know, well, what are the limits of, uh, uh, of, uh, of our uh, progressive uh, past? You know? So uh, here, uh, here, then there. So um, my question it has to do with, as you were talking about these refugees mm -hmm. in like uh, the country surrounding mm -hmm. Israel. Yes. So um, part of it, of my understanding is, yes, so there was a role that Israel had in like taking them out of Israel, yes. but isn't there also a part of it where the other countries had kind of uh, say in it, I'm like, I think it was like Hamas or something, it's like, here, come out of Israel and we will destroy the people who are trying to take you out of there and we will give you back your homes later. Right. Don't they also have something to do with that? And also it's the fact that they're, they're refugees in these other countries yeah. and the countries will not give them citizenship right. in their own countries. Uh -huh. Don't they also have, like, don't they also affect the refugees too? Uh -huh. Well, uh, so first with what happened in 48, and this was repeated again in 1967, by the way, with about another 200,000 people. Um, there's, uh, for a long time, there was a discussion that, uh, uh, that uh, various Arab military leaders, you know, broadcast these things saying, flee, we'll drive the Israelis out. And it, it was something that was quite famous, you know, inside, especially inside the Israeli narrative. Um, uh, research since then, uh, especially uh, over the past uh, uh, 20 years, but even before that, um, research since then uh, proved it all to be completely false. Um, now, there, um, and, but, but even, even if it was true, which it, to be clear, really is, there's, there's no historical evidence for it, and there's much anecdotal, anecdotal and documented evidence against it, you know, including meetings of Israeli officials. You know, at the at the time we're discussing this. So, um, and, but even if it was true, under what conditions, if you leave your house, should you not be able to go home? You know, what do you have to do when you're gone to not be allowed home? You know, and so so that's something you know to consider as well. Is that and if you look historically at war, war displaces a lot of people, and so far as people are capable, they try to come back afterwards. And so, even if we take that narrative as true, it still doesn't justify any kind of uh, exclusion. It still doesn't deny people the right of return. You know. And now, for the, the various the various neighboring governments uh, as well, um, most of the harshest criticism I hear about the way they treat the refugees comes from refugee organizations themselves. So the proper resolution is right of return. You know, being able to go to your home. But in the interim period, of course, you should be treated better wherever you are. And, and there's actually international covenants that should protect the refugees until right of return is achieved. But should they also be given like citizenships to temporarily to the countries that they're currently in? I think the host countries of refugees should take whatever step is possible, you know, uh, to uh, both to, to to help the refugees both in a very immediate material sense, you know, to make sure they're not starving in refugee camps and also to facilitate their political demands, which not always, but is quite often the goal to return home. And so if, if a refugee wants citizenship, if they want to permanently settle someplace, well, sure, I support, I support my migrant justice wherever in the world, right? And so, but, but if the refugee's primary political demand is not to become citizens, but instead to return to where they're from, then that seems to be the political demand on the host government that should bear the most weight. How can the host government help them uh, achieve right of return. Um, and if you if you follow stuff by, like for example, Badil, which is a Palestinian refugee rights organization, you can find 
um, innumerable harsh criticisms about what the Jordanian government, uh, the Lebanese government, uh, the Syrian government, the Egyptian government, and others, you know, uh, do to Palestinian refugees. And so they have a responsibility for abusing the refugees, but right of return is about going back to Palestine. And that's what solves the refugee problem. And what do you think, that, does this have anything to do with like Hamas, of how much they're abusing the refugees and like wanting the refugees back to go to I'm not saying that like, they should go back to Palestine right. or they don't have the right, but sure. how much of it is like Hamas forcing this idea of them right. wanting to go back? Well, um, the idea of the right of return was enunciated uh, about five decades before Hamas was formed. Uh, Hamas, uh, Hamas was formed in the 1980s. It was founded, uh, officially founded in 1982. It didn't really become much of a political force until what we call the First Intifada, you know, until about five years after that. And even then, it was a pretty peripheral part of Palestinian discussion until the mid-90s. So, but but the, the refugees' demand to be able to return to home um, was not only articulated very very quickly after after expulsion, after after what what Palestinians call the Nakba, you know, the, the catastrophe. And so it was articulated very very soon. And more than that, Palestinian refugees attempted to return home. These were called the infiltrators. You know, lots of infiltrators were killed just trying to go home or to harvest their fields, you know, to do other things. And so, uh, so you've had constant attempts for refugees to return themselves. You've had demands for support from the governments from where they are. And so attributing it just to one political ideology uh, is, is, I think, um, not really justifiable uh, if you look at the, uh, the historical record. Uh, so um, we, we can follow up more as you need. So. I really appreciate the sort of framework of settler colonialism, and I think it's uh, very informative yeah. both the comparisons and in terms of understanding what has happened in, um, in Palestine. <clears throat> As I think about the comparisons, one difference that I ask you to remark on is that there is this historic connection of the Jewish people to Palestine uh -huh. that the British certainly didn't have to North America, sure. Dutch and British didn't have to South Africa right. or to Australia. So, I, so you, you know, that, that's a, a difference that is what are not interested in your thoughts? Sure. Well, um, it's one of the things that's less common among settler societies. So far as I know, there are only two settler societies that claim indigeneity. One is Liberia, the other is Israel. You know, most other settler societies don't, it's not something that's just as great, right? So, but uh, uh, the, settler, the settler caste in Liberia also claims to be the indigenous population, right? And so, um, but, but in this narrative, a really important contextual point is that as, as in the Jewish community, as we trace our history, we trace our lineage, you know, uh, through various expulsions and uh, uh, destructions of temples, time in Babylon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I skipped a little. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, we, we should also note that the same, the same uh, ancient Israelites, Judeans, you know, um, the Israelites and Judean uh, communities were later referred to as Jewish, um, Palestinians trace their roots through the same period, except for expulsion. You know, they're both they're both traced to Canaanite populations, and so the Palestinian narrative, the narrative of the indigenous population when Jewish settlers came, you know, the narrative of the indigenous population accounts for what we claim in our own lineage. And I don't want to get crazy about like phenotype or, or anything like that, um, but at a very superficial level, for the most part. No one would look at me and say, "Oh, you're probably from the Eastern Mediterranean." You know, I look, I look for whatever term, I look very European. You know, and so the, the place, so while I trace cultural history all over the world, you know, um, I'm, I'm also pretty sure that I'm not actually, you know, that I don't have probably any. Well, I'm sure actually, in fact, that everybody in this room has a direct ancestor. Uh, the way that I don't want to go into it. the the way that you know you've got uh, your parents, right? So two grandparents, theirs, and then it, it, it branches out so quickly, you only have to go back a couple of thousand years to find a single common ancestor for everyone in the world. Only about 250 years to find one for almost everyone in the United States. So they overlap very quickly. And so, so a lot of lineage, you know, if, if we look at how it actually happens, this lineage um, doesn't really hold, in, 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 it shouldn't guide our ethics. Maybe that's the way. And so even if I trace a certain lineage back that way, it doesn't mean that I can uh, privilege myself over someone else, even if they don't tr trace their lineage through the same way. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the fundamental part about it too, though, is that when we talk about settler and indigenous, it's at the moment of encounter. 
You know, so when the settlers arrive, they find they encounter an indigenous population. You know, and so we became settlers no matter how we trace our narrative, uh, based upon the encounter itself. Um, the thoughts in my head are kind of muddled. So the question may be muddled too. Oh right. Um, but it has to do with the idea that notwithstanding Golda Meir right. and notwithstanding the ostensible equality on the kibbutz, right. um, can you give some notion within the, the progressive community that you're connected yes. to, is there any conversation about the lack of women in leadership, yes. policy-making positions, mm-hmm. and the relationship of that to the seeming intractability yeah. in, the, in the Middle East? Yeah, yeah, there's, um, in fact, the, the Israeli organization that I think does the best work is one called Fulfil Hadas, or New Profile, you know, and it's a feminist anti-militarist organization, and they're completely wonderful. Um, they're actually the folks behind what are called the Shemina's team, Hebrew yeah. for seniors, yeah, so they're high school graduates that refuse to, um, to graduate into uh, what, what, what really we should call our warrior caste. You know, and we refuse to be part of the dispossession of Palestinians. So they, they, they want to connect, you know, in a different way entirely. And so the, the so new profile is a big part of this. Um, but generally speaking, um, and this is very true in the United States as well, our concept of feminism isn't related to anything that would be recognizable by, say, Audrey Lord. You know, our, our concept of feminism is, uh, is is different entirely. Um, various notions of, of equality as being something to be achieved, equality in whatever field. And so um, so we actually celebrate a lot of women's participation in Palestinian removal. And this is part of the, the liberal discourse. There was a very big uh, headlines in, in the newspaper several years back now. I mean, it's not that, but it's about five years ago now, when the first female fighter pilot dropped a bomb. This was seen as like, you know, uh, you've come a long way, baby, you know, some, something along those lines. And... Um, and the IDF on International Women's Day last year, I believe it was, they celebrated what's called the Caracal Battalion. And the way they defined it is a Caracal is a desert cat uh, from the Maghreb, um, and south of the Maghreb, I think, as well. It's a desert cat, and the way that they said it is that what's notable about the Caracal is it's barely possible to distinguish the genders, you know, between male and female. And so it's a, it's a female infantry battalion, but it said, no, oh, you can't even tell. It's the Caracal Battalion. You know, they kill like men, you know? and. Um, and, and, and this dominates a lot of discourse. I mean, and again, you've got really awful liberal feminism in the United States too, right? That says, oh, we, that, you, that used to justify invasions of Afghanistan, you know, like a saving mission of sorts, right? And so, that there's, so it's a abuse, like that, that's not something that's specifically Israeli. Now, inside the Israeli left, the more radical left, that wouldn't accept something like the Karakal Battalion, we still tend to uh, denigrate it in a certain way, or say that, you know, or, or, or branch off into this single issue organizing, you know? Like we're anti-occupation forces, we're anti-apartheid activists, you know? Yeah, 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 we support feminism, obviously we do. But this, you know, and, and we tend to not connect the two, as you said. You know, to say that, you know, these are patriarchy and it's pretty tied up around here, you know? I and mean, one of the earliest things from the first Zionist Congress, this is in Basel, is 1895. This is a, a famous thing, uh, at least in kind of dissident history anyways. So you had a group that went to Palestine, a group of Zionists that went to Palestine to do a survey, you know? Because um, this is during the time of Herzl. This is when Zionism really picks up as an ideology. Um, and so you, you, so the, the, the delegates return, and what they say, and uh, I butcher, butcher the exact quote, but what they say is that um, the bride is beautiful, but she's uh, owned by somebody else, something along those lines. Or she's already there. No, she's already promised to somebody else. I think is how it went. And and so and, and even there, it's about you know who can possess it. You know, Paul Palestine's already possessed. You know, and so we, we we don't look at this gender discourse very often. And uh, inside the left, we, we we really don't, generally speaking, as well. With some notable exceptions, uh, the Isha Isha Makum from Misti in Haifa, which is a Rala Mazali. It's the the woman to woman feminist center in, uh, in, in Haifa, it's a wonderful place. Um, uh, the Jerusalem Women's Coalition was doing interesting stuff for a while, but they fell apart maybe five years ago or so. Um, and then New Profile, uh, which is a really strictly grassroots uh, funded organization. Um, in, um, I can't really comment uh, so much on, on the internal discussion of the Palestinian community about the same. In a very superficial way, I've heard similar critiques 
Um, but the context is obviously quite different. And the role that is played in both in day to day lives of resistance um, as well as ideology and action is also different. Um, so. Thanks. Yeah. All right. What, uh, what would be the best course for justice yeah. in terms of uh, the refugees? Would it be a, uh, a two state uh, contract of sorts? Would it, would it be. Can you go into that? What, what do you think would be justice in, the, in these? I can lay out a couple of things, but it's really not my place to define the terms of Palestinian liberation. You know, it's uh, Palestinian liberation can be defined by Palestinians. And so, um, but uh, with regards to where it would sit vis-a-vis -vis numbers of states, I don't know that, um, that that would answer the question. You know, normally when we think about justice here, or we think about it anywhere in the world, you know, are we thinking about the quality of freedom or the quantity of states? You know, normally the quality of freedom is what we're looking to pursue. And, um, but but I, I would defer to Badia again as one of several different representative groups uh, of Palestinian refugees. And uh, uh, their discourse is not tied up in one state or two state either. You know, a right of return under two states, they seem to be fine with it. Under 10 states, they're great with that too. No state, great big anarchist solution, they're great with that as well, you know. So it's the idea of right of return. Um, and um, but but as far as you know, defining the particulars of it, it's, it's you know, it's not in my place. And, and just a quick follow: how, yeah. how many hundreds or uh, thousands, tens of thousands of refugees would you say there are in the surrounding countries? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it's about five million now. Million. Yeah. yeah. It's uh the you had the uh, the popu Palestine was depopulated. The area that became the settler society, where where Israel became was depopulated of its indigenous population by around 90%. Mm -hmm. And now the descendants have also experienced population growth like we've seen every place else in the world. You know, we've had a huge demographic upsurge in the entire world since then. The refugee populations were no different. Um, and so you, you so the, the original somewhere between seven and 900,000, sorry, uh, between 600 and 800,000 refugees added to 250,000 more in 1967 have also expanded their populations. Can I just add Please. that, like, we're, we're continuing to focus on the refugees who are outside, where it's ah, nice and living in the Arab countries, and therefore the Arab countries are responsible right. uh, for their repatriation and giving them citizenship. Right. But there's a whole problem of refugees who are internally displaced within mm. historic Palestine, who actually have no ability to go to their homes, right. and live in refugee camps and refugee conditions yes. in within the West Bank, mm -hmm. and within Gaza, actually. Yes. What is Gaza about a refugee camp, yes. an expanded one? Yeah. So the question isn't just external. Right. Israel is held to blame both internally and externally. Right. So that's something that I think we need to talk about as well. Sure. It's one of the reasons why the city of Nazareth grew so much too. Right. There's lots of Palestinians with Israeli citizenship who can't live in their historic villages in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, historic Palestine. Even, even though they might only live a few kilometers from it, they're prohibited from doing so. You know, uh, they, these are called the present absentees. And there's a, 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 a three-film uh, three series. It's a, in theory, a fictional narrative by a tremendous filmmaker named Elia Suleiman, who narrates the stories of kind of the present absentees. Uh, the most recent one that came out of it was called um, The Time That Remains. And it's a gorgeous, amazing, lovely film, both cinematically as well as a powerful story. And so that tells, and, and, and so, so you're a refugee, but you're only, in, you know, you're less than 10 kilometers, you know, from your village. But, but, but you're not allowed to go there, except perhaps to maintain the church or mosque. You know, maybe you can go there for that. Maybe not, but, but that's about the only relationship. And uh, thank you for pointing that out uh, entirely. Um, Las preguntas? <laughs> Thank you again, Jimmy, for your uh, thoughtful analysis, your inspiration, to, your call on us to uh, act for justice. I uh, want to encourage people to join us for refreshments. I'd like to, those of us who are active with CNY, working for Just Peace, to just stand up for a second so that if you're interested in talking to some of the people involved, you can see who, who we are. So, uh, Mark, stand up. <laughs> in this room, but we certainly are happy to have other folks join us and get involved. Uh, last thing I want to uh, do is to appreciate our uh, videographer, Nick Papatonis. Uh,
Nick is amazing at getting stuff up on YouTube very quickly, so if you look up Syracuse Peace Council on YouTube within the next few days, this should be up there. Uh, tonight. Tonight it will be up there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so feel free to, to, to find it, to share that information with friends who couldn't be here tonight. So again, thank you. Uh, join us for some refreshments, conversation, the work to to bring justice to Palestine, to Onondaga, to the United States, uh, to Libya, etc. So, thank you. Thank you.